about sessions uh, because her own life story exactly spans that of modern viticulture in the Mornington Peninsula. She was born the year that the first vines were planted there, the first modern vines. Um, but although uh, her parents uh, have had the estate moved up for quite a long time, um, her initial career path, or at least her studies, didn't go in the wine direction. Um, she has an honours degree in French and drama. Uh, but once she started work, it was into wine, but not with a family vineyard, more um, into the marketing uh, side of wine. Um, she had worked in retail import um, with restaurants. and. Um, so it was marketing rather than making. And in 2005, she came back to the family estate, again in largely a marketing role. Uh, she's currently the marketing and business development manager, but she does get her hands dirty and she does get involved with the winemaking with her father. But let's let Kate tell us the story. Over to you, Kate. <laughs> Thanks so much, Liz. Um, well, it's, it, it's going to be a slightly rambling story because that's how that's how I uh, how I roll. And I think that um, first of all, I'd like to say that having grown up with the vineyard and the winery sort of in the background of my life for all of my at least my secondary school education, uh, I was very lucky because. I have three siblings and my, I'm the eldest. My father would take me to the winery while mum took my two sisters who were ballerinas for a long time to ballet all Saturday. So I'd get to sort of hang out at the winery and earn some pocket money pruning or not, depending on my mood. And and a lot of that um, back then I was, I was quite um, resentful of, particularly as I got older and we'd go down to the winery every weekend and... All my friends were going to parties and meeting boys and I was pruning vines and helping with vintage. So I was absolutely determined that I was not going to, I was not at all interested in, in the Mornington Peninsula or the wine industry uh, and got a job for what I thought was going to be maybe six months in a wine shop and fell in love with it immediately. This was after my university studies and uh, and realised that, ah, Laura, <laughs> I think having, um, having language skills and also um, being able to present uh, has been really useful for my whole career in the wine industry. And, uh, and I think that, that, that it's how I managed to bluff my way into a job in a retail store. Uh, I said that I wanted to learn about wine and I could read French labels and Italian labels because I'd studied some Italian as well. And, uh, and that got me that got me through. But it has been really lovely. And I, I actually realised very early on in my mid-20s that I needed to do some more formal study for the to working in the wine industry because I was working with a lot of it's still it was very male dominated uh, still is and a lot of people would immediately go to the boys to ask them for advice rather than me so I looked around and decided I didn't want to do a wine making or a wine marketing course which is ironic because they're the two things that I spend my time doing these days but I landed upon the master of wine and that was a that was another uh, little journey for me and it took sort of the best part of 10 years for me to get my head around what I had to do to study and be successful in the Master of Wine and then to actually do it. We didn't have WACT here in Australia in uh, in those times. So it was really just saying, oh, I've got some wine industry experience and jumped in feet first. So so that's sort of my, that's my wine background. But in parallel to my sort of evolution and coming back to the family business, the Mornington Peninsula was evolving and changing uh, over the same period of time. Uh, as, as mentioned by Liz, uh, the, the modern, um, so the Australian wine industry has been, as you know, uh, has existed since Europeans came to Australia, but the Mornington Peninsula was never settled by Europeans um, who knew how to make wine. It, the Scottish and English settlers, mostly on the Mornington Peninsula, who brewed some beer and, uh, and, and enthusiastically consumed the product, but weren't that interested in trying to make it themselves. So there were a few people who had little starts and stops along the way, but uh, the modern Mornington Peninsula wine industry started in 1972 with some vines being put in the ground by Bales Meyer, who 
uh, is part of the Maya family who are one of the wealthy Australian families. They're, they're, um, they're, they're associated with the Maya's retail stores and lots of other um, farming um, and lots of, lots of old money. And he decided that he'd been to Bordeaux, I think, and thought it would be quite nice to grow some grapes and have somebody make some wine for him. So he planted Cabernet. Um, nobody really knew what the Mornington Peninsula was going to offer. And, uh, and very soon after that, uh, Nat and Rosalie White established Main Ridge Estate and they planted the first Pinot Noir on the Mornington Peninsula as well as the first Chardonnay. Uh, when my parents, we actually also, my family history was that my father was a young student doctor. He, uh, as was the tradition back then, finished his training in the UK in the late seventies. And we went over to uh, Oxford in 1976 and ended up staying for four years. And he did some, he got a job uh, at the um, Radcliffe Infirmary and he did some, uh, he did some extra study, got some more qualifications. And while he was there, he made friends with a couple of people who, who really influenced his, he'd always been interested in wine, but he kind of got fast forwarded while we were in the UK. He had a very good odd bins um, down in Summertown that he used to spend a lot of time at. And he had also some colleagues who, who encouraged him and helped him to learn more about wine. So he came back to Australia with this crazy idea of planting vines somewhere where he could be and still have a medical career. So he really needed to be in a capital city. And he thought, I can't be in Melbourne because when we left Victoria, when we left Australia in 1976, there was really no, there was no uh, wine industry in Victoria, sort of below Rutherglen and central Victoria. So uh, he was trying to work out how to get mum to move to South Australia or perhaps, perhaps to Sydney so that he could, uh, or maybe Albury so he could buy some vines that he could get to within an hour. And when he got back, it was 1980 and he met some people fairly quickly and did some pretty, um, Fancy, fancy networking and found out that not only had the Yarra Valley been re-established during the time we were away but there was this new region called the Mornington Peninsula that people were quite excited about and he met up through a friend of a friend with Gary Crittenden who established Dramana Estate that then became Crittenden's and Dad and Gary were looking for land together and Gary found the property that became um, his family's vineyard and Dad found the property that became Muraduck Estate both in 1982, uh, purchased them and Gary was on the fast track, dad was on the slow track. And so it's been the same ever since. Uh, when we started out and in the early days of the Mornington Peninsula, everybody planted Chardonnay because if you cast your minds back to that time in the, in the late seventies, early eighties, Chardonnay as a single varietal wine in Australia was a new and interesting and exciting thing. Um, it, it hadn't been done for very long and people didn't really know uh, what its potential was, but there were a lot of people who'd done their study over at UC Davis and come back and sort of taught people how to make Chardonnay the American way. So we planted Chardonnay. We also, we didn't really know what the climate was like and dad really wanted to plant Pinot Noir, but he was advised by all the experts that he talked to and remembering he'd, he had no formal education in viticultural winemaking at this stage. He was a, a smart young doctor who, had a fantasy to, to grow some grapes and make some wine and, and thought it would be a good second career for him rather than becoming an elderly surgeon that they were trying to keep away from the patients when his hands got too shaky. So he did have a plan for this to be a proper business, but sometime, you know, down the track and, and it was a lot of trial and error. He, he, like a lot of people, selected the land because he got a good feeling about it. He, they did you know, the minimal amount of research to understand what the sites were going to be like. And he selected the, the property that became Muradak Estate, the McIntyre Vineyard, because it had a north facing slope. Um, the soil is, is very sandy and, we th and he thought that would be good for drainage, which turned out to be a very good thing in the uh, wet maritime climate that we have on the peninsula. But all, everything else was sort of just guesswork and trial and error. Uh, he as well as planting Chardonnay, he planted two rows of Pinot Noir, which were terrible clones. And he was, as I said, was told not to bother planting Pinot Noir because it was never going to work in Australia and probably not outside of Burgundy. So that was sort of the, the wisdom of the ages. Uh, and he, along with a lot of other people, were stubborn about that, inspired by Nathan Rosalie with their early Pinots and, uh, and just sort of 
had a bit of a feel around and, and very quickly planted more Pinot. He also planted Cabernet and other Bordeaux varieties, including Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc. And funnily enough, they didn't work so well. I've got a ball underneath me. I'm going to hope that she gives up on that very soon. Otherwise, I might have to go and retrieve it. <laughs> um, it was really, as I say, it was real trial and error for the first 10, 15 years of, of planting grapes and growing grapes. And, and we did it all as a family. We did it on the weekends. And that's how most of the businesses in the Mornington Peninsula started. This hasn't been until very recently very much, if any, uh, investment from big wine companies in Australia. It's seen as being a bit too marginal for, for what Australia traditionally produces or produced. Uh, I think we know that Australia can produce lots of lots of different interesting things depending on where you are and 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 what you do. But it it was seen as too difficult, too expensive, too fiddly for the big companies to to establish. So most of the family, most of the businesses are family run. They're mostly very small uh, vineyards, and that's become a real advantage for us going forward, as well as a lot of the other people who have continued with what they're doing, um, because. There are a lot of people. Also, the other thing to, to keep in mind is that back in the 80s and early 90s, the Victorian government paid people to plant vines uh, in new wine regions and, well, didn't pay them, but gave them significant tax um, deductions for doing it. So it was a very good way for, for uh, people who were earning money in other, in other areas to sort of invest in a, in, in a vineyard and, and write off some some tax and uh and so there were a lot of people who planted vineyards who haven't continued down the track because they discovered that it was actually quite a lot of work to to have a vineyard and to have the wine made by someone that, that cost quite a lot of money and then you've got to sell it and it's not it's not that romantic idea that people had of sitting on the porch with looking at their vineyards drinking their wine with their friends there was too much wine to deal with so as a result, over the years, a lot of these people have kind of, they established vineyards back in the 90s and these vineyards are still there, but they don't want anything to do with them except to look at them. So we now, as well as having our 12 acre vineyard, uh, we lease three other vineyards and we lease part of one of the biggest vineyards on the Mornington Peninsula, which is the uh, Robinson Vineyard, uh, owned by our friends, Hugh and Isabel Robinson. Um, I'm going to switch to my share screen uh, now because I've got a little video to show you which I which I was going to talk over the top of but we might just put the talkie over for a sec while I calm the ridiculous dog down um, who was very well behaved when we did the rehearsal but of course is now being a brat no problem. so this is some imagery of the Mornington Peninsula a bit of a uh, bit of advertorial this is the Pinot Coast Okay. along the southernmost edge of Australia, only one hour from Melbourne, where your indulgent journey begins. A land... Okay, that's enough of her talking. She goes on for about a minute in that soporific voice. But basically, the, the whole point of things like this is that it's taken a long time for... Victoria as a wine industry to really get our act together and get professional and try and promote ourselves um, in a way that is that makes sense to the rest of the world. There's a lot of individual winemakers who are doing good things overseas, uh, but but to bring the three coastal maritime Pinot Noir producing regions together as the Pinot Coast as a as a concept for for promoting high quality Pinot Noir and other cool climate grape varieties is, is the whole point behind this. So, so we're covering off the Mornington Peninsula in the middle, and this is images now of the Mornington Peninsula. This is Willow Creek Vineyard. Um, as you can see, it's pretty spectacular. And, uh, and we are surrounded by water on three sides. Uh, it's, it's pretty cold water, uh, and that has a huge impact on the style and the quality of the wines that we can make here. Um, it, it, it cools this region so much more than it even cools uh, somewhere like the Yarra Valley, which is, uh, which is equidistant from Melbourne to us, but inland rather than coastal. So, so um, if you look at this sort of concept of the Pinot Coast, Mornington Peninsula is right in the middle here. It's this funny little reverse Italy boot. You've got all of Gippsland along here, which is sort of not as, not as developed as a wine region, but really beautiful and quite wild and gorgeous. And then you've got Geelong on the other side of Port Phillip Bay. 
Melbourne's just up here. And so this is Port Phillip Bay. This is the this is the main bay that Melbourne is sort of built on. It's quite shallow water here. It's slightly warmer, but you can see it's a, it's quite a big um, it's quite a big expanse uh, of water, and that cools things down when we have weather coming across from. If you have a look back up at the Australian map, uh, a lot of the weather in summer here comes across from the west, from uh, from Adelaide um, and across. This is all desert here between <laughs> between Adelaide and the and the wine regions around Adelaide, and then it comes bellowing across um, central Victoria, and and it hits Geelong, and Geelong gets all those hot, dry winds that come off the come off um, the desert and the and and the hot, dry earth. And before it gets to us, it hits this bit of water and it has an amazing effect on just cooling things down a little bit and moistening the air up a little bit. So we don't get those, even in a hot year, we don't get as much of those really hot, dry winds that, that, that a lot of the rest of even quite southerly Australia gets. Um, down here is Bass Strait. So you've got Tasmania right down um, to the south of us. And this is, this is part of the Southern Ocean. It's very cold, very... Um, very uh, quite scary water actually. Quite, it's quite a difficult crossing between the mainland and Tasmania. And then you've got this little bay here, which is Western Port Bay, which has got a couple of nice islands in it, Phillip Islands, where everyone goes to see the penguins. Uh, and there's a couple of nice wineries, uh, vineyards even on Phillip Island these days. But but this is a much deeper um, bay. It's smaller, but it's deeper and it's much colder. So so all of the weather that comes to us comes across the water except from the weather from the north and we do get northerlies in summer and the northerlies come down from New South Wales and Queensland and they can get very hot and very dry but often they're hot and humid as well which is problematic in a in a hot year but where we are we off, we get so much effect from the from the southerlies and the, and the easterlies and the westerlies that often the wind systems will turn around much faster and we'll get that cool change coming maybe after a day of hot weather whereas the rest of Victoria has to wait two three four days maybe a week so it's it's a it's a really special uh geographical position because we have that incredible maritime effect on on our little peninsula and that's what I think makes it very special for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and more recently we're discovering it's a pretty exciting place to grow Pinot Gris as well. So they're the three major grape varieties that are that are being that are being grown successfully down on the Mornington Peninsula. This is a map of the Mornington Peninsula and this is some soil work that we've done over the last 30 years. Uh, there's a lot of geographical survey maps and people understand the soil quite well, but understanding how this affects our, our wine region is really fascinating because if you think about it, we, Muraduck is right up here in the north and we've got, it's, it's all ancient seabed, all of the Mornington Peninsula is ancient seabed, but we're incredibly sandy topsoil and sandy clay, um, alluvial uh, soil with a lot of ancient um, sea creatures deep down. Uh, it's, it's, very poor soil it drains very well and uh, and it behaves it behaves very very well in in both uh cool wet years so we get very good drainage and we're able to um do some disease prevention uh, before a lot of our neighbors are because of that uh, because of our hillside and because of the quantity of sand in the soil but uh but also in the warmer weather it, it kind of stays pretty cool quite nicely this red mass here is uh, is volcanic, ancient volcanic activity. And uh, and here is Arthur Seat, which is the highest point on the Mornington Peninsula. It's about 300 metres above sea level here. And there are a lot of vineyards um, that can be found around this Red Hill uh, main ridge area that's sort of seen as the main um, hub of the Mornington Peninsula, I guess. They get a lot more effect from the weather that comes from the south because they're, they're up high and they're not protected by anything, whereas we in the north are protected by this, by this uprising. We're about 90 metres above sea level where we are and we're the highest point in the Muraduck part of, of the Mornington Peninsula. You'll notice I'm not talking about subregions and we've, we've had many discussions over the last 40 years about you know, how we define the Mornington Peninsula and do we talk about subregions? But we've decided that we want to learn to walk. We need to learn to crawl before we can walk. And I think that a lot of 
new world regions do a lot of decisions about what subregions should be called and who's in and who's out and uh, we were very affected by what happened in Kunawara um, back whenever that happened when they were kind of kicking people out of Kunawara because they weren't on the Terra Rossa and they weren't within the the, the designated subregion that was Kunawara and we made a decision as a as as a region that we would not go down the path of trying to define subregions within the Mornington Peninsula, but more define sort of the the different soil types and the geographical um, effects that different parts of the Mornington Peninsula has by looking at different sites. So single sites are really interesting to us, and because a lot of people are small and make either exclusively single site wines or at least their top wines are all single site wines then we've got a lot of wine to look at to see how how it um how how the site's affecting the wine so the other part of the Mornington Peninsula that's really interesting is down here this is the Merrick side of the Mornington Peninsula and they you can see that this volcanic soil comes almost all the way down to the coast but it's almost also at sea level so they've got they're at sea level with the volcanic soil volcanic soil's got lots of iron in it and it's, it also is free draining so if you're on the volcanic soil you don't have to irrigate your vineyards after the first couple of years if you're where we are on the very sandy soil, you also, we, we, have, we have to irrigate baby vines for two to three years if we're in drought, maybe four years, but then everything's dry growing after that. The vines put their roots deep down. In between, we have a lot of um, shallow topsoil with vine root unfriendly clay. So there are a lot of vineyards sort of in the middle area that have quite shallow rooted systems and that can be controlled, their vigor and, their crops can be controlled very successfully with um, with with how much water the, the vineyards are given. So we have advantages and disadvantages with with whether we're a site that needs to be irrigated or or that's dry grown. But in a country like Australia, where water is expensive and when, it, when we're in drought, then it can become very problematic. Having a site that doesn't need to be irrigated is um, a bit of peace of mind for for me and my family. Um, it's quite cool. So um, what else do I need to tell you about the Mornington Peninsula? Ah, yes, the Mornington Peninsula also, one of the reasons that we've been very good at organising ourselves and getting all of these, um, all of this data together and all of this lovely information is that from very early on, 30 years ago now, um, we established the Mornington Peninsula Vignerons Association, which is which uh, in Australia, the, the word vigneron, and it's really interesting because a lot of people down here who started out were very influenced by Burgundy and by France. And so they borrowed a lot of, uh, uh, they borrowed a lot of uh, French words that maybe these days are seen as being a bit anachronistic and a bit sort of, um, a bit daggy to be trying to sort of um, tip our hat still to, to, um, to trying to make wine that looks like we're certainly not trying to make wine that looks like burgundy we're not trying to we're not trying to imitate or be a little version of burgundy we're, we're now as a region i think trying very hard to identify what flavors and characters we get from our sites and what is specifically mornington peninsula characters i think out in in australia that's sort of better understood because most australians drink mostly australian wine unless they're drinking new zealand sauvignon blanc uh, these days but out in, in the world, and particularly in the UK and the US, which I think are the two, um, the two uh, markets that work best for our wines, um, there's not enough of, our, of the wine from this part of the world in your market yet for people to sort of necessarily get a handle on what Mornington Peninsula has to offer compared to other cool climate Pinot Noir producing sites in Australia. I think that's changing slowly and I think that we're working really hard as a region to to come to the come to the UK and to do to to get our wines um, in front of people and all of those kind of things. And I think as we move along, one of my great great uh, delights was I teach WSET uh, courses and when level two started talking about the two places in Australia to find quality Pinot Noir was uh, Mornington Peninsula and the Yarra Valley. I, 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 I clicked my heels and jumped with joy. So, so we are making, uh, making inroads slowly, but we're tiny and um, less than 5% of the peninsula is planted to vines. So, so again, it's to me, it reminds me, it doesn't look anything like it and the climate's 
different, but it reminds me most of when I travel in Barolo that you've got lots of little sites that are all sort of in different directions, facing in different ways and have different, different local climates. And, and it's, it takes a long while to get anywhere because you get turned around very quickly on the Mornington Peninsula, lots of little twisty turny roads and, and trying to get here, there and everywhere. It's not a very big region, but it takes a bit of time to get around and, uh, and it's easy to get lost down here. So, so the Mornington Peninsula Vineyards Association has just rebranded in the last 12 months as MP Wines, um, for better or for worse. And, and we have had, uh, before the current CEO, the previous CEO, Cheryl Lee, was, um, was in charge of, of the messaging for 20 years. So we've had very consistent messaging and very good working together as a region for a long time. And Olivia Barry, who's taken over the role, is taking it um, to the next level, which is really exciting. Um, because we know each other, because we all do, uh, we do, we work together on various different uh, trials of, of um, how different rootstocks work in different vineyards and how different clones of Pinot Noir work in different sites and that kind of thing. We get together and taste each other's wines quite a lot. We talk a lot to each other and it's actually a very, we're not all best friends, but we work very well together and we do get on very well as a wine region. We're very, um, we share, we share as much uh, of the knowledge that we, we're sort of getting about our region with each other because we're all, we all feel like we're still learning and it's all still, you know, it's, 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 um, it's, it's all, it's all a discovery still. So it's quite exciting times down here. Um, I might pop out of the screen share for a moment. Um, and if anyone wants to ask any questions, please, uh, if there's simple ones about say the Mornington Peninsula, for example, um, please feel free to pop them in the chat. And if I get a chance to, to answer them along the way, I will, otherwise we'll come back to them at the end. Um, the other thing I was going to say is uh, that uh, a lot of a lot of the things that have happened in recent years to the Australian wine industry has not. I think that because the Mornington Peninsula is not uh, producing wines that most of the world expects of Australia, and I'm talking, and we sell at Maroodah Estate. We, as I said, we sell our wine in the UK, and the UK market's very educated and very. Um, very, very sophisticated as far as understanding all the wines of the world. So it's an absolute joy coming over there and talking to people because a lot of people already know where we are, uh, understand what we do, all of those kind of things. I go to America and we sell a little bit of our wine in California and in Texas and in New York. And I still get people who say, I've been going up until COVID, I've been going over there every year for five years. And I still get people who say, oh, I don't need to taste your wine because I know what Australian wine tastes like. It's Barossa Shiraz and it's Yellowtail. So there's a lot of work still to do in the world and even in Australia to get people to understand that Australian wine doesn't have to be hot climate wine. It doesn't have to be big Shiraz. Um, there's a lot of regions in Australia that are doing really exciting things with um, Mediterranean varieties, but but those things don't work we, where we are because we're we are we're significantly cool um, compared to almost everywhere else on the mainland. Uh, it means that we can grow Chardonnay that has beautiful flavour development because we get quite long hang times for the Chardonnay, so the flavours develop slowly and 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 we get depth of complexity without losing natural acidity uh, and we get beautiful natural uh, we get beautiful acid line in the Chardonnays um, I think that there's been a little bit of uh, a style war in Australia about Chardonnay generally which uh, which uh, is interesting and I think a lot of people in Australia have swung from making overripe over over oaked, over mailowed uh, wines from warm climates, way over to the other side to making almost underripe, very, uh, very linear, um, tight, uh, sometimes impenetrable Chardonnays that are that are quite hard work. Uh, and and um, I get cross regularly with people who say, "Oh, this is very Chablis." Like I'm like, "No, no, Chablis is ripe. It's just a very cool region, whereas this is unripe and high acid and not." Uh, um, but on the Mornington Peninsula, we have beautiful acid and beautiful flavour development. So I think that we're finding that the Chardonnays are settling into a style that we're seeing. We're seeing that lovely line of acid. We're seeing beautiful uh, citrus fruit characters and we're getting some nice grapefruit coming out of the better sites as well as lovely lemon citrus and moving into white stone fruit. 
there's a big there's a big sort of chat about whether you should let Chardonnay go through malolactic fermentation or not. We we do because our winemaking philosophy is very much that um, that if we can if the wine can stabilize itself uh, during the winemaking process by going through malolactic fermentation, we know that we get pretty low malic acid levels in our juice, so it's not a huge transformation from fruit from our vineyards, and it just gives a little bit more creaminess without losing too much acidity. Um, and, and we, we rely on natural yeasts and we rely on natural malo bugs to, to do the conversions for us. So once we've got the wine in barrel, we can just sit back and go, oh, no, we, we, keep it, we keep it a quality eye on things, but we do let nature take its course um, as much as possible. And if we pick the grapes at the right time and the hygiene in the vineyard and in the winery is successful, then uh, it's the best way to make wine because you're not trying, can you hear it's just started raining here? <laughs> Um, so Chardonnay is a delight to make down here. Pinot Noir is also lots of fun. Uh, I'll talk about Pinot Noir in a minute, but Keith's just asked about smoke tank challenges. Uh, it, oh, that's interesting. Um, I'm not sure if there is a ban on burnings uh, until the 15th of March, Keith. Uh, we would love for that to be the case. But um, in fact, in our part of the world, we, we've been working really hard, uh, our association talking to the local uh, fire authority so that they actually report to us when they're planning to do burn offs. And they tend not to do them much more, much before March because it tends to be too hot and too dry, uh, even, even around our part of the world to be able to safely burn off before then. But, uh, but, but we've been very, very lucky that we haven't had um, major burn-offs uh, prior to, to harvest in the Mornington Peninsula for, for many years. And that's partly due to, to working really hard with local council and with the local fire authorities, but also a bit of good luck as well, because the, the, the conditions haven't been right for burning off, which is why we've had also in previous years, lots of, um, lots of bushfire issues in Australia, because when we're in drought in Australia, then we don't have a lot of time during the year to go and do the burning off. And there's a lot of fuel out there in um, out there in the wilderness and in the in the bush and also on properties. So when fire does take off, it as we've all seen, it it it, it really uh, creates absolute havoc and it's very hard to get it under control. Um, the last few fire major fire events that we've had in Victoria have not been anywhere near the Mornington Peninsula. So uh, in 2019, you know, last year was just such a, was such a traumatic year for, for people. We went from bushfires um, at the close of 2018 into 2019. And as soon as we'd sort of got that under control, then COVID raised its head. So it wasn't, wasn't lots of fun, but, but um, it meant that, uh, we, our uh, Wine Australia were very, very much on the front foot and the Australian Wine and Brandy Corporation were very much on the front foot of assisting uh, regions to do a lot of sampling going into vintage uh, and checking for smoke taint in grapes by doing small batch ferments and, and, and doing organoleptic tasting and training people up to to, to, uh, to have some experts in the region. I went to one of these trainings and I discovered because apparently... Uh, certain people cannot physiologically identify smoke taint very well and I'm one of those people so I'm hopeless at that I don't I don't have the I don't have the uh, the ability to to identify smoke taint so I'm one of the people that we can uh, market smoke tainted not very heavily smoke tainted wine to and I'll probably drink it quite happily whereas give me a cork tainted wine and it makes me very upset I'm very sensitive to that uh, but yeah so um, smoke taint has been a huge issue and will continue to be a huge issue in Australia because of because because of global warming, climate change, whatever you want to call it, um, lack of water, dryness. We've had a really cool La Nina year this year, and uh, too much water has been an issue for other bits of Australia recently. You know, we had flooding in New South Wales and in Northern Victoria, and also up in in Queensland. But um, but down on the peninsula, again, the the wet weather kind of went across us, and we had a really lovely, cool, uh, and quite dry season this year. So we're quite excited about the quality of and the style of the wines coming out of 2021. Uh, we've just put everything to bed now, so we're 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 literally at the end of vintage and. 
um, because it was quite a cool year, but because it was dry, everything just clicked along slowly and there's lovely complexity, there's lovely structure. The alcohols are slightly lower than we'd usually see them, but with really good flavor intensity and really lovely acidity. So, and the pHs are, are naturally um, really low. So, uh, so it's been a bit of a dream year as far as that's concerned here. Um, people are checking smoke taint. Uh, I don't think that we've seen any in the wines uh, on the Mornington Peninsula yet, but as I say, we had a little bit of smoke haze coming across here just after New Year for a couple of days, but that came down from either from Northern Victoria or even, even from, this, from the New South Wales fires. So by the time it's traveled sort of 500, 1,000 kilometers, then it's usually lost most of its potency as we understand, but it's still, it's still something to keep an eye out for. And uh, if we could teach people to enjoy wine that has smoke taint in it, I think that might be a good future marketing um, <laughs> program. <laughs> All right, a um, couple more photos maybe. That's okay, not a problem. Um, uh, here we go, share screen. Look at me being technological. Uh, so a few things about, I'm not just gonna talk about Muraduck, but I've got some, I've got some pretty pictures uh, here. That's our um, mum and dad's house, basically. They built it to run a restaurant and bed and breakfast they did that for 10 years and then decided that was a really dumb idea because they were working all the time and so they then um, have turned that into uh, just a really lovely place to have people to come and visit so when you guys can all travel again you must all come over on mass on a on a big exploration trip and we'll do a big tasting in the in the in the winery um, that would be nice now my my thing doesn't seem to want to move. Here we go. Let's see if we can get to the next. There we go. All right. So this is the same map that we saw before, but with some slightly different colours and some slightly different information in it. Just to show you, um, the McIntyre Vineyard is our family vineyard, uh, which is um, the little... Sorry, I'm pointing with my finger. I should be pointing with my arrow. That's the McIntyre Vineyard there. And the garden vineyard is just across the road and over the hill from us, owned by friends of ours. They grow some Pinot Noir and some Pinot Gris for us. The Robinson Vineyard is about four kilometres as the crow flies, and it's one of the biggest vineyards on the peninsula. It, they've got 65 acres under vine. Uh, it's a 100 acre property. Um, it's beautiful and, uh, oh, go back. Uh, and it's uh, up for sale at the moment if you know anyone who wants to buy a beautiful property on the Mornington Peninsula. <laughs> We're hoping somebody nice. Hugh and Isabel Robinson are in their late seventies, like my parents, and they don't have any children who are interested in uh, running a vineyard and um, grape growing business into the future, which is terribly sad. And it's an ongoing problem uh, in our part of the world that passionate um, people came from other careers to start up their vineyards. And some of them have kids like me, who there's a few of us who are second generation, Rollo Crittenden with Crittenden's, Mike Aylwood um, at Ocean 8, he's second generation. So there's a few of us, um, but other people have had to either um, sell or put on a, a more professional team with employ employees rather than doing it themselves so it's just it's still evolving it's quite interesting um the osborne vineyard is another little vineyard just uh down the road from the robinson vineyard where we get um, most of our fruit for our second label which you don't get to see in the u.s so it doesn't really it's not really relevant but you can see they're all in the northern part of the peninsula they're all within five kilometers of each other and we really love the character that we get from this part of the peninsula it's as i said it's sheltered by this um big hill from a lot of the a lot of the southerly winds, it's uh, it's so it's a little warmer. Uh, we get a lot of weather that comes across from the west, as I said, and we sometimes our biggest issues are um, hail and storms during flowering and fruit set. That has become more of an issue on the Mornington Peninsula in the last 10, 15 years, and we've noticed that vintage has moved. So the vines wake up about a month earlier than they did back in the 80s and 90s. And so vintage is now generally at the end, starts at the end of February in our part of the world and the beginning of March further south, uh, which is about a month earlier than it used to. Uh, Dad's, Dad's birthday is on the 28th of March. And if we were picking fruit before Dad's birthday in the early days, then it was a good year. And if we were picking them after Dad's birthday, we were fighting, fighting against the, the weather the autumnal rain coming through. 
So uh, I think that really um, the change, the change in the climate down down here has certainly had mostly a beneficial effect so far where we are. And you hear this from a lot of a lot of cool regions, uh, but. You know, we are slightly nervous about whether it's going to continue to be a good place to grow Pinot Noir into the future. But we do think that the fact that we're surrounded by this cold water, um, as long as we don't go underwater as the ice caps melt, we've got we've we're, we're being the weather is being modified quite significantly by that, and and might be our saving grace for a bit longer than some of the other um, cool climate regions in Australia. Pinot Noir. Uh, so oh, this is um, <laughs> so this is just a before this is a before and after photo. This is Dad in the paddock that became our vineyard um, in 1982, and this is Dad last year tasting some wine for a Zoom tasting I was putting on. This is Hugh Robinson, and this uh, I don't know if I, all of your faces are in the way of Jeremy, but that's Jeremy, our winemaker. I've got another photo of him in a minute. But while we kind of contemplate the uh, the ravages of age. <laughs> And dad's delightful shorts. Um, let me talk a little bit about Pinot where we are because I think um, we as a region have hung our hat on Pinot Noir. Um, please tell me if I'm going on for too long because I, I'm just just checking the time making sure that I'm not like taking too much of your time up but uh, but I think Pinot Noir is the most important thing. Just kind of wave at me if I'm if I'm if I'm going I'm checking the time every now and again. Um, Pinot Noir on the Mornington Peninsula is the great variety that we've hung our hat on. It's the, it's the variety that we put as our first step forward whenever we show the wine either in Australia or overseas. And I think that that's because it reflects, first of all, it's, it's a little more difficult to grow and make well than Chardonnay. There's a lot of really good Chardonnay being made in lots of different places in Australia. So it doesn't really... The Chardonnay by itself doesn't really distinguish us from other high quality uh, cool climate regions in Australia, but I think our Pinot Noirs really do. Um, where we are, in, so the Pinot Noirs from the Mornington Peninsula, I think uh, these days have a, a distinctive cherry fruited character at their core. Sometimes where we are in the northern part of the Mornington Peninsula, it's more often dark cherry and in the, in the southern part of the peninsula where it's cooler, it's more often red cherry. Um, the cherry character is much more, uh, much more overt than berry fruit uh, where we are, and uh, and it's surrounded. It's not, but one of the things that I think is really lovely about the Pinot Noirs from our part of the world is that they're not just fruit bombs. They have this beautiful core of um, usually quite uh, quite seductive fruit, but they're surrounded by really lovely savory um sl some slightly herbal notes and sometimes you will get a little bit of that wild mint the that that australian terroir um, but also uh sage and rosemary and thyme and all of those things is sort of a, a and a lavender kind of perfume um, we get roses and violets in good years uh, particularly in the northern part of the peninsula but also some um more uh, exotic spices and in a cool year there's sort of black pepper and uh, and Asian spice sort of soy soy um, savoriness uh, and in a in a warmer year you get more Moroccan spice you get more lift more rose petal more uh, cinnamon and cardamom and uh, coriander and those those kind of characters and I think that along with the structure of the wines from our part of the world do make them quite special and and delicious drinking at their best and also a bit different from what everybody else is doing. The differences are not extreme, but Pinot, you know, Pinot is such an expressive grape variety and it is also such a frustrating grape variety because we always know that we can do better. And that's, that's the other thing. As our vines get older and as we understand the sites better and we understand which clones do well in which sites. So there's all that sort of exploration going on. Um, I think we get better and better at it. So this is the this is the vineyard today. Um, that was that paddock that Richard was standing in. Uh, that's our original Chardonnay vines um, straight in front of you, and off to the right, uh, the old Cabernet vineyard that we grafted over to Pinot Noir about twelve years ago. Uh, and um, and those vines gave us our best Pinot Noir for a number of years and then failed dramatically. We have, like a lot of Australian vineyards, um, quite a bit of Utipa through the vineyard. So we're doing some renovations there and we actually made the decision 
in COVID year 2020 to pull out those old vines because they had failed over the previous two years and they were going to have to be, that vineyard was going to have to be renovated at some stage in the next five years. And we thought, well, what better time to do it than um, when we're not sure how much of our wine we're going to be able to sell for the next little while. Uh, it hasn't been nearly as dramatic as we thought it might have been. Um, and we don't sell to China, so that hasn't been a direct uh, influence on us, the fact that China's not dealing with Australia at the moment. And it doesn't look like China's going to deal with Australia for a number of years. So um, that's a bit of a shame, but it's also, I think it's a good opportunity for us to work more with the, with the um, markets that love us and appreciate us. That's my mum and dad and me from a couple of years ago, but we look much the same. My hair's a bit longer, but, uh, but yeah, we, you know, mum and dad um, have been living down there now since, um, 1999 full-time and dad retired from surgery soon after that mum ran the restaurant this is jeremy our winemaker with some of our chardonnay grapes um and you can see lovely that lovely color they, they they were it was about a week before we picked them that that photo was taken so they they developed a little bit more flavor um but really lovely um small bunches uh delicious grapes and so now we're 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 a great little team it's dad and jeremy in the winery full time i get to dip in and out of it because um i'm also as 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 previously explained the marketing manager and um business development manager and communicator and all of those things so uh <laughs> Yeah, this is um, we we do a lot of work in the vineyard these days with um, with trying to grow uh, plants that will encourage carnivorous insects, so that we don't have to use insecticides in the vineyard. We're not we're not ever going to be fully organic. And um, my father is a, a, a devoted atheist and and sees um, biodynamics as just another religion. So so there's no chance of us going down that path. Um, as such, while he's around, uh, I find it quite fascinating, but you know, that's, that's all well and good. But what we are interested in is keeping things as natural as we can, um, with, with also making sure that we've got some quality control there. So you'll see we've got nets on, because we have a lot of bird pressure once the once the um, grapes um, braise and the whole of the morning peninsula is netted, nobody can grow grapes on the peninsula without losing the whole crop. Um, without you'd lose the whole crop um, to to birds if you if you didn't net it, and that's our clover field um, that Jeremy has uh, submerged himself in, which I think is wonderful. And we got lots of lovely insects to um, keep things under control. As a result, Polly looking beautiful in in the vineyard. Just a chance to show you um, our funny old Chardonnay vines. Really, they um, they were plant those vines were planted in 1983. Uh, we started out. Um, with them at, on a Scott Henry trellising and they've been converted uh, I think about 10 years ago so they're a bit ugly looking these days but they're still producing the best quality Chardonnay fruit that we get and we're hoping that we'll be able to keep them going for quite a long time in the future. Um, all of as I said to you before all of the operations are very hands-on and very small scale so this is our this is our fruit processing. As you can see, we rely on gravity. We don't like to pump must. So we, we use a forklift to take the fruit up to the top of that tower of power. And then it gets tipped down through the destemmer um, into our two ton fermenters. Uh, that's me with some barrels. I'm not quite sure. Oh yes, barrels, nice. <laughs> that's, that's, and this is our fermenting room. And so we're able here, all of our Chardonnays and Pinot Gris are fermented in barrel. So it, the juice goes straight to barrel from the, from the press. And so we have lots of little, um, little batches that we can play around with when we're making final decisions about what goes to the estate wine and what goes to the single vineyard wines. And the same with the Pinot Noirs, that they're, two ton, they're all, a lot of little two ton fermenters. Everything gets vinified separately so that we can keep everything, all the components, all the different clones, the different vineyards, the different parts of the vineyards separate until, until we, make a full analysis of how good the wine is and where it should go in the hierarchy of things at Muraduck. Our little cellar door. Um, so just speaking of the hierarchy of Muraduck, um, this is the estate label that probably if any of you, those of you who know our wines, that'd be the label you'd be most familiar with because that was the original artwork. Um, Devil Bean Creek, as I said, we, we haven't been able to make enough of that to supply the domestic market. So we haven't exported that for quite a long time. But these are our single vineyard wines. 
um, Robinson Chardonnay and the McIntyre Chardonnay, and we do a Garden Vineyard Pinot Noir as well. So um, lots of little bits and pieces. These wines we make maybe 150 to 250 dozen of those in a good year. Um, the estate wine, we produce about a thousand cases of each of our estate wines, a bit less of the Pinot Gris because it's hard to sell expensive Pinot Gris here. Um, and the Devil Bean Creek sort of, it, however much we can make, the Chardonnays have been pitiful um, in quantity recently because we've been working on, everyone pulled Chardonnay out back in, you know, back in 2008 to 2010 when everyone stopped drinking Chardonnay. So there's a, there's a terrible um, dearth of quality Chardonnay fruit out there in, um, in, in the cool climate world of Australia at the moment. So ideally we would make a couple of thousand cases of each of those Devil Bend Creek wines, but the Chardonnay um, a lot less at the moment. Cellar doors are really important on the morning. So the Mornington Peninsula thrives mostly from the tourism trade. Um, direct sales, having nice little cellar doors, maybe a restaurant, maybe a cafe, you know, that kind of thing. We did the restaurant thing. We offered coffee for a while and we've learnt through experience that the best thing to do if you want to sell wine at your winery is to just offer wine. So, so we've just pulled it all back to just a wine tasting. Um, we're working on our wine club um, and talking to the people who already are engaging with our wines and helping them to buy more of the wine more easily. And a lot of that is local sales. Um, but this is a lovely little space to come and do tastings and it's all, it's all kind of friendly and lovely. I just thought I'd put a little list together of our challenges now and in the future. Um, it's sort of a bit random um, with diseases and pests, but also bigger, bigger things. So, you know, phylloxera, we don't have phylloxera on the Mornington Peninsula yet. It's in the Yarra Valley. So we assume that it will probably get here eventually, but we've just spent, we, we got a grant from the Victorian government to check. And we've spent the last four years testing all the soil on the Mornington Peninsula where there are vines and there was no, they've, they've not found any sign of phylloxera. So a lot of the vineyards are own root vineyards still planted from the early days. When we replant, we replant on rootstock and um, which I think is a little bit sad, but that's the romantic in me. Uh, I think that um, the rootstocks are very good and you know, it's a sensible way to go. Um, Utipa dieback, I've mentioned before that we're having, you know, we're having to renovate significantly the vineyard either pull things out if the utip has gone too far or cut them right back and bring them back um, the insect issue and powdery and downy mildew and botrytis are the major um, the major issues as far as uh, as far as hygiene in the vineyard is concerned birds climate change and COVID are, are the other obvious um, challenges this is an image of where our pinot vineyard used to be so we've actually um, taken this opportunity after pulling those vines out to really work hard on getting that soil in top condition before we replant it. We will probably replant it with Pinot Noir, but we do have eight Nebbiolo vineyards in the bottom of the vineyard that we got our first fruit from this year. And we were quite uh, heartened by the quality. You know, it's hard to tell when you've got eight vineyards and you make a, a bottle and a half of wine, but you know, that was quite fun. Um, I took uh, my parents and some other wine friends to Austria and Germany in 2019 and dad fell in love with Blau Frankish so we might be we might be playing around with some Blau Frankish and the other grape variety that he's really interested in and I don't think anyone's doing much within Australia at the moment is Mencia from Spain so um, not sure what we're going to do with that site yet. It'll probably be mostly Pinot, but there could be a little experimental vineyard in there. And I think that we're always looking to see what other varieties could work in our space, particularly if it gets hotter and drier where we are. That's a wheat crop at the moment. And dad's a mad keen baker. And so he, he's, he's allowed himself to have a couple of wheat. It's a ridiculous place to grow wheat. It's not the right climate, but he managed to get some wheat off it um, a couple of months ago and we're doing one more so he can make bread that's truly from the site as well. He's a madman, but you know, got to let him have his little, his little um, games. These are our young new Chardonnay vines that we've replanted um, in the Ute in the um, in the area that's most affected by Utipa. And you can see little grafted vineyards. You can see little grafts down there. Just a picture of the vineyard. Apart from that, so we'll keep moving on. There's this is what we're doing in the vineyard again. Polly helping, very helpful. So we've cut those Shiraz vines and we do have a little bit of cool climate Shiraz at the bottom of our vineyard as well, in the same site where the, where the uh, Nebbiolo is. 
and we make about 100 to 130 dozen um, bottles of Shiraz every year and it's very cool climate and um, it's a whole bunch fermented so it's kind of it's it's probably the wine that's weirdest for people who drink Australian wine and know what Australian Shiraz tastes like I get a lot of people saying why don't you call it Syrah because that would make more sense but it doesn't in Australia because Australians don't really know what Syrah is and it's just another French word to confuse people we're in Australia Shiraz is the name for the grape variety and I'd much rather have that conversation with people about the fact this is what Shiraz tastes like when you grow it on the Mornington Peninsula in a cool climate. Um, so those vines are just coming back to life again. And we got a little crop off those this year and it was so much better than the crops that we've had off the old vines that we cut off a couple of years ago. So we're quite excited about that. Um, just a couple of other things that we've been doing down in our part of the world that I thought you might be interested in is that COVID has made us all much more aware of the need to have an online presence. and. There've been people all over Australia doing online tastings, but this seems to have stuck, this thing that I've been doing um, every Thursday night at 6 p.m. We sell a six pack every six weeks to people who wanna buy it. Um, and we open a bottle every week. I give them suggestions of food that they might like to snack on and we have a chat. We do it through YouTube. And um, it's, it was something that I thought I'd do for maybe a couple of months last year while things were really grim and it's become a really integral part of our business and important part of the wine club. So they won't let me stop. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite fun. And I think it's really exciting to see that, you know, it's probably not so exciting for you guys because you haven't come out the other side yet. But when you come out the other side and you can go out and you can do things and people still want to do a little bit of this, once you get over your Zoom fatigue, I think it's, it really is, uh, a nice way to communicate with people who are a bit too far away to actually sit in the same room with. So, and I think with the rate of the um, vaccination program here in Australia, we're not coming to the UK for at least another 12 to 24 months and probably won't be having very many people coming here, which is a bit of a shame, but we'll all get past that in the long run. This is our team. I just wanted to really kind of um, bring home that fact that almost all of the businesses on the Mornington Peninsula are family run. Um, and, you know, Linda in the front, this is Linda, she runs our office and the logistics side of things and she's been with us for 20 years. Jeremy um, feels like a younger brother these days and hopefully he'll be with us for a long time. And Jeff looks after Celador and our online presence. So we're a really, we're a tight little team and, um, and everyone does too much and helps everyone else and it's, it's really nice. So that's the end of my photos and that's probably just about, the end of my presentation and I've missed all of the questions. So it's probably time to take some questions <laughs> if there are any or comments. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Kate. That was wonderful. Very fascinating. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. Glad that Polly decided to settle down anyway. <laughs> yeah, she's gone to sleep now. <laughs> well, there's a couple of questions there. Pinot are related, I think. Keith was asking about what the typical yield for Pinot Noir is. Yeah, so um, we find that the best results are at about um, one to 1 1.5 tonnes per hectare. So we're really talking sort of um, Grand Cru, hectare, acre, Grand Cru, Grand Cru vineyard kind of level. Sorry, it's, it's getting, a bit, getting a bit late for me. <laughs> Numbers are not my thing, words are my thing. Um, but yes, uh, we, we, sort of, we sort of model that off Grand Cru um, yields in, in France and that seems to work best for us. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, go on. And Sue was asking about what clone, which clones and rootstocks are typically used. So rootstocks, I have no idea because it's really new and there's lots of trials going on. So I'll have to, I have to take that question on notice and report back. Um, clones, on the other hand, uh, Pinot clones, we're very, we're, we're very geeky about down here. Um, one of the most successful Pinot clones on the Monitor Peninsula is the Australian clone MV6. Um, which came out uh, back in the 1850s. Uh, so that works really well, but we find that as a, as a monoclone, a monoclonal wine, it, it's a bit four square. Uh, so a lot of people really like uh, 777, 667 uh, from Dijon University, a bit of pomade down here. And we do have, we've got, more and more able clone um, springing up around the place. Uh, I'm sure you you guys all know about the able clone that went to New Zealand before it came here. Do, do you guys know that story? Um, 
Yeah. I'll tell it to you very quickly. Um, it, it's it, it was it, it it was rumored that a New Zealand grape grower had jumped the fence at Domaine de la Romney Conti's La Romney Conti vineyard and stolen a cutting, and tried to smuggle it back into New Zealand in his gum boot. So it's also known as the gum boot clone. And uh, he got caught by the customs officer. And luckily, the customs officer, whose name was Mr. Abel, was a wine lover. And when he pleaded his case, Mr. Abel took the cutting and put it into quarantine rather than burning it as he should have. And now that Abel clone or the gumboot clone in New Zealand uh, is quite a significant Pinot Noir clone there. Atarangi has a lot of it planted and quite a lot of other people do too. It came to Australia. The rumour is that it came to Australia illegally as well. Someone smuggled it in, um, but it's legally in Australia now and it seems to be doing very well in the cooler climates. Mm. Yeah. We don't talk as much about clones with Chardonnay, but we are interested in some of the, the Dijon clones, um, 95 and 96 and the Mendoza clone, but a lot of people have the old Penfolds clone um, and some UC Davis clones that were sort of gathered from other vineyards around the region in the 1980s. So it's kind of what you could get your hands on at the time. Sure. Mm. Um, one quick question from Keith, another Keith was what percentage of your sales are cellar door? That's growing all the time, Keith. Um, it, at the moment, it's probably, it depends if you're talking about volume or value, because we get, the value is much better from cellar door, but it's about 40 to, yeah, about 40% volume at the moment, which is, which is really good. And we've invested a lot in the, I've been back working full time at the family business for, 12 years now and that was my main that was my main sort of aim when I came back was to really get Celador up to a, a level where we were really you know getting much more value from it uh, so yeah I know we're getting a bit short for time so and Rosemary was asking about who is brunch pressing uh, pre or post fermentation for the Pinot and the time in barrel yeah, for us, for us, very, um, very, very quickly. Most of our, most of our Pinot Noirs are um, are destemmed. We've got one single vineyard Pinot Noir and our Shiraz that we do as whole bunch fermentation. Uh, it's not quite what you asked, Rosemary, but um, we we cool the fruit when it comes in because you. What I meant to ask was whole bunch. That is what you meant to ask. Oh, okay, because we do. Whole bunch. Andrew didn't see. <laughs> That's, that's okay. We did um we we do whole bunch pressing of our white wines and 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 we don't crush the fruit at all for the white wines. The whole bunch pressing straight straight to tank and we stir it up so that all the solids are evenly distributed and then it goes straight to barrel and um, leave it to go through its ferment. We find that the red wine, um, uh, if we chill it down to about twelve degrees. Uh, it takes about five to seven days to get started. So we have a nice pre-fermentation maceration. Then during fermentation, we'll pump it over once and then we'll plunge it twice a day. Once the ferment's finished, we'll close it up again and we'll give it a post-fermentation maceration. So it spends about um, 19 to 21 days in a normal year on skins in total. So we do like to work the skins quite hard with the wine and it, we like tannin in our Pinot Noir here at Merodac Estate. It's not what everyone does. In fact, lots of people are kind of really backing off from working the skins that hard, but we, we, think, it's, we think it's worth it for the, for the um, character of the wine. And we think the fruit can handle it. <laughs> That's super. Andrea, That's, Andrea yes. Jerry, can I just have a quick Thank you to Kate. I'm sorry I don't have a chat thing on my um, iPad, but Kate, I just wanted to say thank you so very much. I first came to the Mornington to meet Gary and his family in 1992 with Hazel Murphy, and we had the best, best time. He has become an extraordinarily good friend, and I would be very pleased if you could send my best wishes to him and Zoe and Rollo. And he keeps me in touch with what's going on in the Mornington. And I just want to say thank you for such, mm -hmm. such information, such interesting and lovely and understandable lecture, if you like. Um, not a lecture, just chat. It was wonderful. <laughs> anyway, my name is Cherry and I'm sorry I didn't put the chat through, but my silly old thing doesn't work. <laughs> and, my very, and he loves Nebbiolo, so keep up with the he Nebbiolo. Does. He's thank one of you, his favorites. <laughs> And you were absolutely great. Thank you, Kate. And one day, I usually come every year, but not last Next. year, not this year. We'll see. Yeah, Thank fingers you crossed it'll be soon. Thank you again. My pleasure. Thanks, Terry. <laughs>
Thanks, Jerry. That's wonderful. Um, over to you, Liz, just to sign well, off. Okay, thank you. Um, Jerry has expressed what we're all feeling, I'm sure. That was an absolutely super presentation. Um, wonderful images, great enthusiasm, and such a fascinating subject. One thing I particularly got out of it is so many similarities with a wine region that um, I'm sitting in the middle of at the moment, the south of England. Yeah, <laughs> which is, which is lovely. <laughs> So, so, so that was really very, very good. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Astrid um, from Spritz Marketing and PR for, for introducing um, you and setting this up. So, and if anyone wants to know more about uh, the Muradoc uh, wines, do get in touch with Astrid. She's very happy to provide lots of information. Thank you again, Kate. And I hope we will be able at some point to take up your invitation. We'd love to. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs>